All right. Um, good morning. Uh, my name is Jenny Allen, and I'm the Nanslo CHEO admin assistant here at WICHI. Uh, we are delighted to have Dr. Bronwyn Evans and Dr. Beth Marks with us to talk about assisting students with disabilities to enroll in allied health programs and secure jobs. I'd like to speak a little bit about our um, presenters, and then I'll hand it over to them. Um, so, Dr. Bronwyn Evans is a professor and director of PhD in nursing and healthcare innovations at Arizona State University and the former vice president of the National Organization of Nurses with Disabilities. Evans joined ASU in 2004, and before that, she served as associate professor at Intercollegiate College of Nursing, Washington State University College of Nursing. Evans is an expert in recruitment and retention of nursing students from diverse backgrounds, including those with disabilities and informal caregiving in Mexican-American families. She has also researched and has published in areas of nursing education, caregiving in border populations, psychosocial, cultural, and spiritual health disparities in end-of-life and palliative care, and mixed method studies. She earned her PhD in education and her master's degree in nursing, both from the University of Washington, and a bachelor's degree in nursing from Washington State University. Dr. Beth Marks is Associate Director for Research in the Re Rehabilitation Research and Training Center on Developmental Disabilities, University of Illinois at Chicago. She's also a research associate professor in the Department of Dis Disability and Human Development at UIC, and immediate past president of the National Organization of Nurses with Disabilities. She directs research programs related to the empowerment and advancement of persons with disabilities through health promotion, health advocacy, and primary health care. She co-edited a special issue in Nursing Clinics of North America on health issues for persons with de developmental disabilities, a feasibility study report to advance nursing education at Bel Air Sanatorium and Hospital in Panjgani, Maharashtra, India, through the WHO Co Collaborating Center, UIC, and apologies if I pronounce that horribly and a monograph on primary health care in the Americas for the Pan American Health Organization and the World Health Organization. Dr. Marks produced a documentary with Dr. Evans entitled Open the Door, Get Them a Locker, Educating Nursing Students with Disabilities. She has authored two books entitled Health Matters, the Exercise and Nutrition Health Education Curriculum for People with Developmental Disabilities, and Health Matters for People with Developmental Disabilities, Creating a Sustainable Health Promotion Program. And uh, we are able to bring Drs. Marks and Evans to present to us today through funding by a grant awarded by the Department of Labor. And all of the material we see today has the Creative Commons Attribution 3.0. So at that, this point, I would like to um, hand things over to Bronwyn. Good morning, everybody. Dr. Marks and I both welcome you to the webinar. We're very pleased to be able to do this for you today. And we hope we'll be able to assist you in learning more about disabilities and how you can help uh, students entering health professions. We would like to acknowledge our um, backup along through the years, first of all, the National Organization of Nurses with Disabilities. Second, Karen McCullough, who is a past president. Robin Jones, who is with the Great Lakes ADA Center. And Martha Smith, who has been very instructive to us on technical standards. We also send out a thanks to the Office of Disability Employment Policy U.S. Department of Labor, which has been so useful in creating an alliance with us 
and um, promoting um, the inclusion of students with disabilities in the health professions. What we would like to do today is begin with discussing barriers to entry and retention. Um, then Dr. Marx is going to talk to you about some daily evidence of the barriers that we see through the National Organization of Nurses with Disabilities. She'll go ahead with the medical and social model comparison, the ADA and its amendments, um, the paradigm shift of interest in these issues, the essential functions that are associated with employment versus the technical standards that are associated with education. And then I'll take up with accommodations and our responsibilities in regard to those and a few words about systems change. So that said, there is a wide range of influences on nursing and allied health professions that really impact our willingness and ability to um, admit students with disabilities. First of all, there's um, a definite conflict between the social and the medical model view of disability. And, and as I said, Dr. Marx will talk more about that. Um, the attitudes of key stakeholders about admission and retention of students tend to be that students are actually more our patients than our peers. Um, we see there was just a nurse educator article that came out this summer that um, talked about uh, nursing students not being allowed to have accommodations because they were just essentially um, trying to work the system. So there's a great deal of discrimination. Um, we especially find difficulty with students needing clinical placements. And um, we also see a reluctance to self-identify uh, and a lack of knowledge about disability rights on the part of students with disabilities. They don't know what their rights and responsibilities are under the law. And many times, they have not actually been diagnosed with a disability until post-secondary education. And you all may have had um, this experience. And then the diagnostic process can be very um, expensive. They also don't know much about um, accommodations or the use of adaptive devices and technology. The other side of that, the faculty, they know very little about this as well. There are also few role models among faculty um, to provide mentors for students with disabilities. And there are few students with documented, acknowledged disabilities uh, to serve as role models for, for other students. There are many students in our programs with disabilities, but often they keep it to themselves because of stigma. And so Beth is going to talk to you a little bit about um, the things that come, the inquiries that come into the National Organization of Nurses with Disabilities um, uh, that um, really document the barriers. OK, good morning, everyone. Um, Thank you, Bronwyn. Um, I, I promised before you all joined the call that I would not spend the next eight hours. It, this is actually something that Bronwyn and I have been pretty passionate about for going on over probably 15 years. So very excited to have you all on the phone. Um, as Bronwyn said, some of the the request that we get through the National Organization of Nurses with Disabilities um, relate to the fact that healthcare professions still have many, many daily barriers um, that people are facing. And I'm going to have you go to the next slide, please. On, on the student side, um, what we see is students struggling to just get admitted into health profession program. Um, we also see 
Well, both Don Wynn and I are registered nurses and work within colleges of nursing. What what we have found over the years is that some of the policy procedural barriers that have prevented students with disabilities getting into nursing school have also been extended to the Allied Health Program. So PTOT, um, um, those are the two big ones, um, that nursing assistance program. And then the other piece is that nurses with disabilities often are in significant danger of, of job termination or if they um, continue to have their disability or chronic conditions wherever they wherever they have them they went off work, returning to the job market is a challenge after they acquire a disability or chronic condition. And so next slide please. Um, some of the questions that we've had, one, one was um, a student who acquired quadriplegia, um, she had an accident during her nursing program, and um, in, in trying to keep her in the program, she actually went back to school fairly quickly after she had her injury and became a quadriplegia. But she ran into issues when she had to go into the clinical setting. And so what what we did in terms of trying to have her help her be able to progress was we worked with her to really learn how to advocate for herself. Um, so we did sort of an advocacy one oh one. We provided her with documentation as as Bronwyn mentioned. Um, some of the barriers she talked about, um, the social model versus the medical model. We also talked about, um, in her case, disclosure wasn't an issue because she had an apparent disability. Um, but we also talked about the lack of role models and how that makes it challenging if you're a student with a disability and no one is kind of serving as a role model. You're really paving uncharted territory. So when we worked with a student who had become a quadriplegic, quite, quite she engaged um, her administration, her faculty and disability services, and really she took a lead role in, in kind of bringing everyone up to speed and understanding you know, how the ADA would support her being there and also really actively working with her faculty and disability services coordinators to develop um, accommodations. And many of these accommodations are um, specific to the school. So in looking at the work that we've done nationally, schools do vary on what they'll allow for an accommodation and what they won't allow. Um, the other thing that was a real significant factor with this, particular, this student was identifying a mentor within, within her school. And when she identified that mentor, one of the things we talked about was don't, we didn't care if that faculty had anything to do with her clinical program or her, her um, academic program. We just wanted one person within that system that whenever the student had a problem, she could walk in the door and whether the faculty would say, gee, I have just to answer for you, or gosh, that's a great question. I have no idea, but let's figure out how we can do it. So we just wanted a person that would always have a happy smile on their face and, and help the student negotiate sort of the landmines or any problem areas, um, but, but really have a commitment to helping that student pave the way along with the disability services professional. And so the, another example is on um, the work side, the employment side. And one um, young woman that we had who contacted us, um, she had had a stroke in her late 20s. And, and she contacted us probably four or five years post-stroke. And if we had had a checklist for 
uh, you know, to document everything not to do and trying to get the job back. After, after she detailed what she had done, it would have been a perfect checklist. And she really, um, it wasn't like she set out to do everything wrong. It's just that she, going back to Bronwyn's failures, she didn't understand the difference from the, the social model versus the medical model. She didn't know the ADA. She was not a person with a disability, so she didn't really understand disability from a minority perspective and know how how to interview as a person with a disability. So if people are saying things that are outrageously illegal, um, she didn't really know, you know, how to approach that. Um, so one of the things that, and, and, and also with this particular person was she knew she was coming back as a professional with um, with dominant hand weakness. So she knew that she could learn to be a professional with one hand because she knew of other um, nurses who practiced with one hand. But she had no place to go to become a one-handed professional um, nurse. And she had no one to really learn. She didn't have any mentors that could kind of walk her through relearning her skills. So while we have refresher courses to get back up to speed, there's really nothing out there that helps to become a health professional with a disability. Um, so again, from the, 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 the employee side, it's figuring out the same pieces instead of working with disability services professionals, you're working with human resources professionals, and you're trying to get them up to speed on the barriers that John Wynn mentioned earlier and how we can systematically provide support to get people back on the job. And um, this slide is, is a nice one just to kind of deconstruct how health professionals are typically trained within the medical model. So as a student, we learn that disability is negative. We see disability as a deficiency. Hence, that's why we become health professionals, is to make things all better and to make those deficiencies go away. Um, disability is within the person. And the remedy for the disability is to cure it. And so meaning the absence of a disability. And that agent, the, the person who cures it, is the professional. And so with all those things in mind, if that's how we view disability, why on earth would we have people with disabilities trying to become health professionals um, before they're cured? And so there's been a lot of work that really since probably in the UK, since maybe the late 80s, early 90s, around shifting the view that disability is really just a difference, like being female, male, um, racial, ethnic dis differences, that we are all different um, people. And some of us have disabilities, some of us don't. It, but really the disabling qualities are within the environment. So having access um, issues and attitudinal barriers. And the remedy for that disability-related issue is a change in the interaction between the individual and society. So looking at environmental barriers um, for people with disabilities, labor doors, ramps, making sure that you know we're not health professionals wearing you know lots of um, cologne and causing people to go into respiratory distress. Um, and then the last one is that, that that agent of change is really the individual themselves and an advocate, but, but anyone who can be, such as you all, involved in the interaction between the individual and society and, and figuring out how those can be altered. Um, so this is actually the 25th year of the ADA. And the definition of disability is physical, mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. If a person has a history or a record of such an impairment, or if the person is perceived by others as having such an impairment. And a typical example of that is 
people who have non-apparent disabilities or even um, people who have um, a significant burn scars, facial scars, um, cranial facial differences. So there might not be any issues with functioning, but, but when a person sees them and, and says, you know, we wouldn't want you on this job or in this program because you might scare people. That's an example of being perceived as a person with a disability. And the Amendment Act of 2008, um, this is actually one that got passed relatively quietly. And in the human resources world, um, a lot of people still remain kind of plastic that this got passed. And essentially what it did was it expanded the definition of qualified disability. Um, it does um, um, not allow considerations of mitigating factors. Um, so some of the earlier cases that got passed from 1990 to 2008 had a lot of language about mitigating issues. Um, and it, it actually really narrowed who was covered under the ADA. The Amendment Act really sought to um, roll it back and say, essentially, all the case law that got passed between 1990 and 2008 got it wrong. They approached disability from a medical model, not a social model. And in essence, the ADA is really meant to eliminate discrimination based on any, any bodily characteristic. Um, so with the Amendment Act, you only need to substantially limit one major life activity, and now there's extended there's coverage for neurologically based impairments and also chronic um, health conditions are also are, are within the ADA Amendment Act. Um, so, so for people that have you know the non-apparent disability, they and chronic conditions, they would be covered under the ADA Amendment Act. Um, so, with the paradigm shift, um, I'm, I'm happy to say through the non-alliance with. ODEP, the Office of Disability Employment and Policy, which comes under the Department of Labor. Last, um, a year ago, March in 2014, we had a roundtable discussion, and it included Department of Justice, Department of Education, uh, and, then, and most of the, um, the national nursing leadership. Um, and so as a result of that, that was really the first time that there became a, a bigger push and acknowledgement within the federal agent within the federal agencies administration that in order to really shift how we think about people with disabilities that we absolutely have to have health professionals with disabilities. Um, so unfortunately within post secondary education the health health people and the allied health have been the most restrictive and resistant to letting students with disabilities in. Um, so um, the ADA Amendment Act is really um, having a wide reaching implication for education. So it's really an important um, piece of legislation that's good to know about because it's increasing the number of students who qualify as having a disability. They may or, students may or may not know this. Um, and it also intensifies reasonable accommodation um, efforts and overall sensitivity to disability issues. Essential functions apply to employment, not education. Um, we tend to conflate or confuse the two, and it's been translated, unfortunately, into education um, from a document that was published by the National Council of State Boards of Nursing in 1996. Um, for example, we have a whole list of physical things such as you must be able to walk, you must be able to see, you must be able to pinch, um, lift many pounds in order to be a nurse. And so we've used these essential functions really as technical standards. And what that has done really since that 1996 picked up a lot of momentum in 2000. And what we've seen today is that they're used it, these standards are used as technical standards for many, if not all, community colleges across the country. Um, I've yet to see 
a college that's not using them, or a community college. Um, but so what we've studied with these technical standards is able to meet these requirements with or without reasonable accommodation. Um, and as an entry requirement, it's not a skill learned in the program, the what, it's not the how. Um, so must, for an example, be able to gather vitals, um, not necessarily hearing a heart murmur through a stethoscope. So in other words, what is it that we want people to do for what versus we shouldn't be specifying you must be able to hear through this stethoscope. Um, there are many different ways that people can accomplish a task, and that's the key for the accommodation. Um, but, but the challenge with that is that we don't have a whole bank of health professionals who are, or nor do we have books out there that say, you know, here's a range of things. But we do have people out there who are experts, and if you have any questions, um, we can definitely point you to those people. And on that note, um, just how far do I need to go to accommodate? I'm going to transfer to the wrong one and find one. Great. Thank you, Beth. Um, this is the bottom line question for many of us. And for help to answer this question, we can go to the Disability Service Office on our campuses. These folks are definitely our friends. They can help us with faculty education and support and student education and support as well as advocacy. Also, if you happen to have an ADA coordinator or anyone um, within the university who has authority related to compliance with state and federal discrimination laws, you should have that person. And that would be another um, resource for you as you seek to provide appropriate accommodations. So looking at what constitutes an accommodation, it's an adjustment to the way that things are usually done. And this is sort of hard for nursing um, because we come out of the military and we tend to think that there's just one way to do it, um, but there are usually many ways. So a lot of the work is is often done with nursing faculty helping them identify how things can be modified um, to help the student. An accommodation is basically a change to the environment to produce equal access. And uh, examples of that can be an assistive or accessible device to enable someone to accomplish the task, like Beth was saying. Um, in terms of the stethoscope, there are different kinds of stethoscopes to use um, that students can uh, learn to rely on. So what is reasonable? Well, anything can be an accommodation. And so we need to be really open to whatever would help the student uh, do what they need to do. I'm a nursing faculty person, and so I have spent a lot of time not understanding the ADA and not understanding that I shouldn't be questioning students about their disability. But I shouldn't be doing that. I should be encouraging them to contact um, the disability services folks to document their disclose and document their disability. And then they figure out the accommodation together. And then they come to me and tell me what it is that they need. And we figure out how to make that happen. Now the two questions essentially that we need to ask are, would this accommodation cause an undue financial hardship to the school? And does it constitute a fundamental alteration of the program or service that we provide? And if those answers are yes, then we may need to look at a different accommodation. But whatever the answer is, we need a process to evaluate that and an ability um, to defend our decisions. So what are some forms of reasonable accommodation? There are modified schedules like part-time, full-time, breaks, um, 
auxiliary aids and services like real-time captioning or service animals, um, alternative kinds of clothing, um, modified policies and pr procedures. Um, for example, um, in the, in the um, video that Beth and I made, which is posted on the NOND website, um, instead of asking that student to do a standard female catheterization in that usual position, we allowed her to do it in the sideline position. So there are ways to modify things to make them um, accessible. Obviously, materials in alternative formats and accessible information technology, along with captioned video, are really, really useful. We can also modify requirements for procedures. For instance, um, one can say, um, is a student able to just talk about this theoretically, or do they actually have to do it in clinic? There are, um, and, and can they do it in the lab? Um, there are many, many uh, procedures which a student never does while they're in school, but they are held to their knowledge of theory and lab. And so the question is, is that sufficient? So then um, the assistive technology, I learned from Beth that 98% of disabilities cost on an average of less than $500. Many cost nothing and many are shared through vocational rehab services. So it's useful to um, know about that. So what's not a reasonable accommodation? If we have to fundamentally alter a course requirement so that we're not having students maintain standards, we don't have to tolerate abusive behavior. Um, having a disability is, is no excuse for bad behavior. And we don't call it a reasonable accommodation when there is non-adherence to policies and procedures. We also can't provide personal services for um, students in our programs. I'm seeing a question pop up here from Maria. Although we know it's not possible to accommodate for every possible need that may exist before the actual student is standing before us, um, what should instructional designers keep in mind on more general terms? Um, oh, what <laughs> I, I guess I would refer you back to um, universal design things. And I was also let Beth talk about that because she's more expert at that than I am. She's really the disabilities person. I'm the faculty struggling to understand disabilities like you are. Um, so Beth, do you, do you want to take a crack at that question? Um, sure. Let me. Let me. I think it's the second. This is the one, although we know it's not possible to accommodate for every possible need. The second sentence. Mm. You know, um, that's actually a great question. And one of the things that um, we're probably the worst at on an educational side is thinking about, like, um, Films or videos, having everything captioned. So if you're doing something that's auditory, that you also have a visual component to it, and vice versa. Vice versa, if it's visual, then you should always have the ability to um, hear. And one of the best resources out there are the one of the ten um, regional ADA centers. And they are great with thinking about that question in specific. Um, they're the ADA um, Technical Assistance Center. Um, ours in Chicago is the Great Lakes one. Um, what I like about Great Lakes is they've worked pretty extensively with healthcare professionals 
And and the other thing to think about that um, a lot of people it, now with um, YouTube, you can have the closed caption uh, options available. Um, but but that's probably the biggest piece of an instructional design. And I know faculty really complain about that because they complain about the the money. Um, that they have to spend spend to do like open captioning or closed captioning, um, and and the other piece I'm also looking at your reader able document um, PDFs sometimes are not cannot go through JAWS or some of your technology um, available for readers, so you always want to make sure that that a possibility. Um, but as Bronwyn said, a lot of a lot of the accommodations that people need are fairly simple, and sometimes we miss the obvious of having students themselves really look at the environment and say, you know, what is it that, that would really help them function. Um, but, but what I just mentioned in terms of the teaching part, those are the two big things. And by having captioning. Frankly, it helps people who hear quite well because a lot of people are visual learners. So, by having all the slides with text, that's really helpful to everyone. Thank you. And then um, the other thing I would add: Beth mentioned the um, ADA center in her region. I want to give you a phone number. For the National Institute on Disability and Rehabilitation Research, they have established ten regional centers to provide information, training, and technical assistance. And they will automatically, when you call this number, they will automatically route your call to the center in your region. So that um, one eight hundred number is one eight hundred nine four nine. Four two three two. So one eight hundred nine four nine four two three two. Did that help? Let's see what we see on our chat. We see a thank you. All right. And I, I, I just took the website there too. Oh, excellent. Thank you, Beth. So whose responsibility is it? Um, to make these accommodations. First of all, it's our educational institutional responsibilities. Um, we have an, a responsibility to make appropriate accommodations. And we have to make a good faith effort. The courts do not take kindly if we really don't make that good faith effort, remembering that this is civil rights law. And then we have some responsibility in auxiliary aids and services to ensure the fact that these students um, can participate. But it's not just our educational responsibilities, it's the students too. And Maria, your question about um, you can't know before the student is standing before you, that indeed is true, but that student needs to identify the need for accommodation before they are actively participating in a class. And they need to disclose and document and request accommodation so that that can be done ahead of time. It's an interactive process, and it, it, it's not kosher to say, well, after the fact, you know, I had trouble with this exam, but I should have had a disability. No, you need you need to engage in that process ahead of time and get it straightened out before you need to engage in the activity. So the timely manner piece is really important, and sometimes it's hard to get students to to do that for a variety of reasons. So. Um, what should a program do then? Recognizing that there's more than one way to teach something, and as Beth mentioned, health professionals are sometimes pretty rigid. Um, maybe all students don't have to do all the activities and through all the methods that able students do. 
For instance, Victoria was able, um, the student using a wheelchair whom you would meet in the documentary on the NOM website, she was able to do a CPR by um, moving out of her chair onto the floor and using an AMBU bag, a, a mask and a, a bag that you squeeze to um, do um, inhalations along with chest compressions. So it's a matter of changing the activity and method often. The ADA is deliberately written in such a way that it doesn't set precedent when we do something like this for a student, it's vague. We can make a case-by-case -case determination. But we do need to do some capacity building. And this is something that I have heard from Beth and learned from her for a long time, is this capacity building core group we need in the university, the ADA coordinator, the disability service professional, the student, the faculty with and without disabilities, and clinical faculty and staff at placement sites. Um, as coaches, you can certainly help um, build these groups, and you can also help identify mentors and advisors within this, the school to work with the students, as Beth mentioned to you before. Um, creating good technical standards, not essential functions, but technical standards, and using, using them appropriate to education. Recognize that every disability experience is unique. Even similar types of disabilities have some differences. And you can also um, help clinical faculty negotiate student accommodations. Uh, Lavona says, is this being recorded? Yes, indeed it, it is. Uh, Jenny, I see your answer. Excellent. Okay. So um, in terms of clinical um, negotiation, usually a faculty can use their own good clinical reputation to help get students into placements. I got Victoria into the OR, into long-term care settings, and of course community settings are, are fairly easy. So what can we do then? to advance this process. We can all be involved in the education of stakeholders, helping faculty understand and adhere to the ADA, and helping students do that as well, putting students with disabilities and able students together so that they can learn from one another and change attitudes um, so that when they become practicing nurses or future faculty, that discrimination will not be present. We also need to help these students and people with disabilities know that they have a place at policy tables on executive management teams and other key leadership positions, as mentioned in the Institute of Mention, uh, Medicine, Future of Nursing report. And all of this will lead to important health outcomes. There is one thing which we alluded to before, but I'm not sure that we mentioned it, and I wanted to make sure that we did. Um, Beth is the expert on this, but the final rule which came into being on March 14, 2014, from the Office of Federal Contract, it's a 7% a rule that federal contractors and subcontractors have 7% of employees in each job group uh, being people with disabilities. That means healthcare institutions with federal contracts, and that means nurses with disabilities. So that's an important um, rule in terms of creating jobs for nurses with disabilities. There, there will be jobs there. So we would hope to transform practice for all health professionals with disabilities and help them provide culturally relevant care not only to other people with disabilities but to the general population. We want disability to be seen as the asset that it is. 
with the help of technical advances and medical adaptive devices and assistive te technology. Um, when we study and work with other healthcare professionals with disabilities, it's just like working with other people different from ourselves. Our attitudes and perspectives change, and we learn to value them as colleagues with equal skills. Also, um, as an aging nurse, I'm hoping that our compendium of accommodations will grow so that we can use those accommodations for other healthcare workers um, along the way. It's not it's not as easy to do the hard work of healthcare as we age. So, health professionals with disabilities then can enhance our psychosocial skills, our communication, redefine our clinical skills, different ways, innovative ways to do things, and provide culturally and linguistically congruent care. Um, we know the literature tells us that when our patients have culturally and linguistically congruent care, that it leads to far better outcomes and happy consumers. So that's what we're after with nurses with disabilities. Um, a couple of educational issues that we just wanted to end with. Um, training for entry to the workforce. I know that all of you are involved at the community college and junior college level in that. Um, and that is certainly um, an issue with all the returning veterans. And there's a huge place in nursing for those folks with a lot of skills, um, eagerness to learn, um, enthusiasm. <clears throat> we would love to have them in nursing and other health, allied health professions. And then also um, not only returning veterans, but also returning nurses like the one that Beth talked to you about, about the nurse with a stroke needing to come back into the workplace. There's a place for them too. and um, those folks, you will confront those folks a great deal um, in your institutions. We'd like to open things to questions now. There are usually quite um, a few questions. People generally have specific situations that they have run up against that they'd like to ask about, and we'd be happy to entertain those issues if we could do that now. Would anybody like to? Oh. Hi, this is this is Beth. I just wanted to clarify with the new OSCP rule. It, it took effect March 24th of last year, and I um, put a link in the chat box for pointing you to Department of Labor. Um, and as John one said, it really is the first time we've had a utilization requirement. For looking at people, for hiring people with disabilities, so this is a profound change within the legislation. And and what we've seen over the past couple of years, even before it got passed, is that some of the larger healthcare institutions like Blue Cross Blue Shield, Aetna, they knew that this law was on the books. So before it even passed a couple years ago, they were contacting us through non to hire nurses with disabilities. Um, they didn't quite understand that you know people are just I don't have a we don't have a black book um, that contains a list of names and John said there's many barriers that we have to work through which makes it problematic for people. Um, but, but this is definitely an exciting time in education um, is really to really shift how we think about students with disabilities from a value-added perspective, not a deficit model. And by having students with disabilities, we really can have the opportunity to transform health care. And the final rule is a lever that we can use for employers or uh, schools and colleges of 
nursing and allied health to really take the issues seriously surrounding disability and the needs of the students who, who are applying to us. Um, yeah, it, web, I see in the chat box webbing that it is a great resource. Um, thank you for adding that. And Adana, uh, did you see the question on experience with faculty who say, I don't know how to teach the student? I, yes, I just did. Um, I think more often than that question, you get just, I'm not going to teach the student. I, I have other students to take care of, and this is, um, this is not included in my job description, is the, the usual um, way to, that you hear this answered. And there again, um, the disability services professional people can figure out with us how to make those accommodations. And those ADA centers will also help with technical issues of how to teach. Um, I think what I found um, certainly clinically was that there were few accommodations that needed to be made. Um, the chief one was that Victoria, um, when she washed her hands and was ready to approach the bedside, she would wash her hands, double glove, wheel her chair to the bedside, remove the outer set of gloves, and then she was ready to provide care. Um, really, the only other accommodation was that she had made for her a particular pair of white pants that would allow her to easily self-cast while she was in clinical. The accommodations are much um, fewer than we think. Usually with faculty, it tends to be an issue of, I'm afraid I don't know what to do with this student, and but I'm not going to say that. I'm not able to say that. I'm just going to say they're not safe. So Beth is putting up some things from the Job Accommodation Network, which um, are great resources for you. Um, there's also a chapter in um, uh, the Annual Review of Nursing Education from 2005 that I wrote about my experience with Victoria and what that was like and how we accommodated and the issues we ran into. For example, we eventually put her in a white lab coat with a stethoscope around her neck so that nurses in long-term care wouldn't grab her wheelchair and wheel her off somewhere. So it, they're, they're very small issues um, specific to each setting, and, but there's a lot of attitudinal stuff with nursing faculty. Thank you for that question. I think that's one of the most difficult things to get over is that is getting nursing faculty to where they feel their patients will be safe and um, and that that they can effectively teach these students. Most generally, they're afraid. Other other questions? Anybody? I don't no. see anybody typing. <clears throat> Does anybody have anything else for Dr. Evans or Dr. Marks? I, I just put the uh, citation for your chapter um, that you just mentioned, uh, one. Thank you, Beth. Okay, he hearing, hearing no other questions, um, we really appreciate um, your participation today. We hope we've been helpful to you. And um, 
remembering that this was recorded and so it's available for you to listen to later on. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you so much for um, presenting today. We really, really appreciate it and it was um, some fabulous information. And I will um, send out the link to the uh, recording as soon as I have it. Thanks so much. Great, thank you. Okay.